Good morning. morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church of Crockett, Texas. I'm Pastor Michael Bedevian, and I'm delighted to welcome each and every one of you here, and those of you who are viewing on Facebook or listening to our KIVY broadcast. Thank you for choosing to worship with us today. I want to extend a special thank you to Reverend Greg Oburn, who is with us. Greg Oberg is with us today from Sam Houston right here. He is visiting. And of all the churches in the Texas Conference, he chose to visit us today. So we are honored by your presence, Greg. Thank you very much. I understand Greg has uh, preached here before, and uh, I suspect that may happen again. (laughs) Right? I have a few announcements I'd like to share with you today. Today we're going to continue our Bible study in the Questers class at 4 p.m. So we hope you'll be uh, prompt in getting to that. We have our usual meetings on the third week of the month with finance at 5.30 and council at 6 o'clock tomorrow. And Tuesday we have our nominations committee meeting in the upstairs conference room at 6 o'clock. And then Wednesday we have our prayer meeting that happens every Wednesday at 11 o'clock in the questers and choir practice at 7. And then this Saturday, the 25th, we will be celebrating the life of Virginia Scherer. Uh, as you probably already know, she passed away recently and the family will be in from uh, out of town to uh, celebrate her life right here in this sanctuary uh, this coming Saturday at 2 p.m. We hope that you can uh, be here present for that. I also want to make note of the beautiful flowers we have here. They are here as we celebrate the 40th anniversary of Clayton and Renette Star. We congratulate you. Yes, indeed. You know, I like to think of a, a marriage as a reflection of the relationship between Jesus Christ and His church. Uh, in fact, the Bible speaks of it in that way. And, and uh, when, when someone's been married for that long, uh, that is certainly a demonstration of faithfulness, which reflects our Lord, does it not? So we're, we're blessed to have you here with us today. With all of that said, we want to continue our worship with our call to worship found in your bulletin. Let me invite you to join with me now as we share from the call to worship. We are here to touch the hem of grace, to feel the surge of forgiveness, a rush of joy. To hear our name whispered and life affirmed. Let us now stand for our opening hymn, number 371, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. We'll be singing verses 1, 2, and 5.
We believe in God, creator and sustainer of all, Father of all nations, the source of goodness and beauty, all in truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God, presence, us, comfort, and for strength. We believe in forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and we grace and equal every need. We believe in the word of God contained in the old and new, as we set faith and practice. We believe in the church, those who are united and living Lord, for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the region of God, the divine as we rise in human society. And in the family of God, we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and life everlasting. Amen. come to a time of prayer as a congregation, and I would invite you to continue lifting up those that are in the bulletin, <coughs> excuse me, and also be mindful of uh, a few I'd like to lift up right now. Our deepest condolences to Clayton Starr, whose cousin Roy passed away this week. <coughs> Our deepest condolences to the Virginia Sheriff family. Her funeral will be here this Saturday at 2 p.m. And certainly the names in our bulletin, we do hope you will consider all of these in the coming week. Let us pray. <coughs> our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come in prayer this morning in the name of Jesus, our Savior. We're so thankful that you've redeemed our lives and given us the privilege of prayer. We're so blessed in knowing that your desire for our prayerfulness, prayerfulness is rooted in the growing relationship you want with us. <coughs> we want to praise you this morning for your faithfulness and compassion. We give you thanks, Father, for your precious love. Father, this morning we want to lift up those in our church and community who are passing through difficult times. We pray for those with physical ailments and struggles, those recuperating from accidents, those facing surgery, <coughs> those healing from medical procedures. We ask that you would bring them healing, and courage, and uplift them, and may your grace be rich in their lives. Father, they need you at this very moment in their lives in very special ways. And we ask that your presence would bring them hope. We pray that you would use us as vessels of that hope. Father, we lift up those who are walking a path that strays from you, those who haven't discovered the joys of living in a relationship with you. As we pray for them, help us, Father, not to judge others, but to seek the lost out in love with open arms of mercy as your son has done for us. We also pray for our church leaders and teachers. Father, grant them an abundance of wisdom and biblical insight to share with those whom they lead. We wanna be the kind of church that bears fruit for your kingdom, a church that will glorify you every day. And we want to give priority to those things that are close to your heart. So we ask that you would pour out your discerning wisdom upon us to guide us. 
Father, we pray for the elected and appointed leaders of our country. We pray for those who serve in courts, seeking to make moral and ethical decisions. We ask, Lord, that they will all be guided by your righteous discernment in leading this nation. Father, we want to be a nation that is holy and blameless in your sight. And we know we have a long ways to go to meet that standard. There is much justice that must be done. Help us, Lord God, as your church, to understand our responsibility in reaching out in your name to minister to the vulnerable, the brokenhearted, the desperate, the innocent who cannot speak for themselves. We pray you would use each of us in the coming week as instruments of your grace, Father. We pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come together as the church, I would like to share with you that first, the First Methodist family is mindful that faithful and loving worship also includes a spirit of thanksgiving and bringing God's tithes and our gifts to him. And if you'd like to be a part of supporting and continuing the ministries of our Lord through First Methodist, please consider making a contribution to the place located around the sanctuary. Your kindness and faithfulness is greatly appreciated. And as we contemplate the graciousness of our God in our lives and think about how responsive we wish to be to him today with our own gifts to his church. Let us stand and sing the doxology together, giving thanks to him for all he blesses us with. Let us stand and sing. remain standing for our hymn of preparation number 328 in your hymnal surely the presence why don't we sing this through twice
be seated, and I invite our children to come forward to Miss Jolene over here to my right. She has a special message for you. Good morning. We have a small but illustrious group this morning, and it's quality rather than quantity, right? Good to see you all this morning. Uh, I start out by asking you if you know what this is. A calendar. A calendar. That's, and this happens to be one that Miss Tony and her teenagers sell every year. I'll put in a plug for you, Miss Tony. Uh, it's coming up soon, I'm sure. Uh, what do we learn from a calendar? What is a calendar? Date it is and what and you can mark down for a special date. Special occasion? Like your birthday, very special occasion, exactly. It tells us days, dates. What else? Holidays. Holidays. Does it tell you what month it is? Yeah. Yeah, what year it is. So you learn a lot from just this one piece of paper. And I got to thinking about this because we had a very special day uh, last Wednesday. Last Wednesday was the first day of fall. Yeah, the day w was 12 hours long, the night was 12 hours long. So uh, that is a, a special day to remember on the earthly calendar. Uh, starts a new season. By the way, how many seasons are there on the earth? How many? 12, 12 seasons? Or 12? Four. Oh, okay, 12. I know what you're thinking, 12 months right divided into four seasons summer winter spring and fall right four seasons very good well did you know that the church also has seasons yeah we have pentecost is one christmas good and what else easter good 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 Well, exactly seven seasons occur in the church, and I'm going to give you a church calendar. This is sometimes called a liturgical calendar, and it looks a little different than the earthly calendar, doesn't it? You remember one? Lent, yes, yes, y'all are so good, you don't need, I can just go back and sit back down, y'all don't need me to talk to you today. Uh, if everybody will take one of these, Oh, uh, everybody have one? Good. There's two pages to it. There's two pages to it. There you go. All right, let's take your pointer finger. Thank you. And put it on Advent. The, it's at the top of the page, and it's purple. Everybody see Advent? Okay. Advent is the beginning of... Uh, or it's one way to talk about the beginning of the church calendar. And Advent, as you know, is the time that leads to Christmas. Christmas. And you'll notice the color for Advent. What is the color for it? Purple. And that's because purple represents the royalty of Christ. Now, these colors were designated a thousand years ago. We have been having colors for each season a thousand, since a thousand years ago because at that time people didn't get to go to school. They couldn't read. And so the church puts uh, beautiful windows, put special colors so people could remember what time of the year in the church calendar it was. All right, let's move back one. Go to the next one. Christmas tide, it's called, and you'll notice uh, that East, uh, the Easter, Christmas has come, Epiphany has come, and they're white, and it's green, and in green, 
uh, and wearing green, it means that we are praying for the growth of the church, not just this church, which we certainly pray for, but God's church all over the world. Uh, the third season is Epiphany, and you can find Epiphany right there, right after Christmas. And it's white, very good. It begins January 6th, and it ends on um, uh, Ash Wednesday. Next, find Lent. All right, Lent is purple again. And Lent it begins uh, 40 days from Easter. And why do you suppose the color is purple again? It's a church thing. What? Yeah, what was it before? When we were anticipating the birth of Jesus, we said purple is the color of royalty. And so because uh, Easter, again, signifies, the, or Lent signifies that a king uh, is having a special commemoration, then... Uh, our king, for our king, we wear purple. All right, now find Easter. Found Easter, okay. Easter begins at sunset on Christmas Eve and continues through Pentecost. And we call, sometimes we call this Easter tide, and the color is white. Why do you suppose it's white? The Easter bunnies, why? That may be part of it. Could be. Uh, another possibility is that white is a color of purity. And so uh, we think about the purity of Christ. We also wear white at weddings. We wear white at funerals. And so white is a, a, a significant color. We wear white, and you'll notice the choir wears these colors and the pyramids on the altar are also matched with these colors. Uh, but white is also the color that we wear on Communion Sunday. Again, standing for purity. All right, next, troll around until you find Pentecost. You found it? It's tiny and it's red because it's just one day, isn't it? And red is the, uh, signifies the fire of the Holy Spirit coming down uh, and had fire on the top of their heads. You've seen that before. And you'll notice there's only two days that have red pyramids or red colors. And one of them is Palm Sunday, which is a joyful time. And then Hosanna in the highest, right? And then Pentecost Sunday, which is the beginning of the Christian church. And finally, we end up in the season where we are now. Look at all this. Kingdom tide, right. And again, notice what colors we are wearing. Green. And we're wearing green because we are praying for... The church, the growth of the church, very good. Y'all did a great job. Give them a little hand here. Her question is, why is Kingdom Tide so big? Well, because we should spend more time praying for and working toward the kingdom of God to come back on earth? That's a good question and a good answer, I hope. <laughs> Thank you all for coming up. You may go back to your chairs.
Please stand as you are able for the reading of our scripture from Luke chapter 13, verses 10 to 13. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit 18 years. She had bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she strained up and praised God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Will you join me in a word of prayer, please? Oh God, our Heavenly Father, hide me behind the cross of Christ, that the words that come from my mouth will be humble before your sight, but reflect the boldness of your kingdom and your word and your truth, and have transforming power to refine our souls and our minds and our hearts to love you more dearly. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, when I was a junior high age, I got an aquarium for my birthday. And it was filled with all kinds of fish. It had blue garamis and red-tailed sharks and zebrafish and angelfish. And in many ways, having an aquarium at that time in my life was, was kind of therapeutic for my mother and I. You see, uh, it was shortly before then that, that our home had uh, recently become a broken home. Uh, my father had uh, left, and um, it was about then that my self-esteem took a nosedive. But the fish tank, it provided my mom and I hours of entertainment and uh, kind of kept us busy and thinking about that instead of other things. And we learned some things about the fish that uh, sometimes some aren't so good to mix with others because of their aggressive behavior. We, we also arrived at the conclusion that each species had its own way of adapting to their new environment. There was actually an experiment I found out later that, that tests the theory that, that all fish eventually adapt to their environment. And the experiment placed one fish in an aquarium and it, it al is allowed to swim all over that aquarium for a period of time. And then, then after a, a few weeks, a glass divider is placed in the aquarium so that the fish can only swim in one half of the aquarium. The fish then will run into the glass divider, bumping into it only a few times before it learns that it is confined to one side of the aquarium. And from then on, the glass divider can be removed, allowing the fish once again full access to the whole aquarium. But the fish usually will continue to swim only in one half the aquarium. You see, it's been conditioned to limits that in fact do not exist anymore. For some reason, it would not adapt to its actual environment. By now, you may be wondering, what in the world is a preacher talking about fish to me for this morning? Well, adapting to the environment God wants us to adapt to uh, is something I want to talk about this morning. Um, the scripture reading read so eloquently earlier regarding this poor old woman. It was about a person who was having a very difficult time dealing with life and the circumstances around her. She was a pitiful sight, uh, a woman who had been afflicted with a spirit of infirmity for 18 long, grueling years. And she was most likely seen by the people of her day as no one of great importance, just another person worshiping on the Sabbath. So there she was among her fellow synagogue goers, burdened by a system of expectations and demands that she probably couldn't live up to, and she was most likely oppressed by a social system that devalued her because she appears to have little to contribute 
to the world around her. And this woman is probably like many people who find themselves devalued in the world. Eighteen years, this poor lady has been afflicted by the spirit that crippled her. And she was bent over for 18 years. You might be surprised to know that life can do that to a person, believe it or not. Maybe she felt forced to carry the burden of another person's desperate need. Or maybe she was bearing the weight of a child gone wrong. Or perhaps she was bearing the burden of a father who criticized her every deed. Or maybe she's afflicted by friends who love her only if she does those things that they want her to do. And a society that expects her to keep silent about her own problems. The poor woman has been over, crippled, and unable to stand upright. She's in need. And this woman comes to the synagogue on this day to worship God. She comes to pray to a God she's probably heard about her whole life. A God she's heard has the power to deliver people from their bondage. A God who brought her people, his children, her ancestors out of slavery in Egypt and led them to the promised land. And deep down inside, I bet she wonders if that God really exists or cares about her. And so she comes on this day to the synagogue, probably partly out of habit, mostly out of desperation, hoping that someday soon this God of deliverance will deliver her. And she comes in bent over, crippled, oppressed by a spirit that has convinced her that she has no strength, no ability, no purpose, even though she's a child of Abraham, even though she is one of God's chosen ones. She's easy to overlook, isn't she? I mean, she's not the kind of person who just steps forward and volunteers to teach a Sunday school class. She's not introducing herself to everybody. She's probably off in a corner, slumped over, not talking with anyone, and not noticed by many either. In fact, she'd just probably rather just come in and leave. And if the truth were known, that's what happens week after week after week. But it's not because of anything she does. I mean, how many times do you think this bent over woman had come and left worship without anyone ever giving a nod in her direction? How many times do you think she came without receiving a warm welcome, a compassionate hand from someone else there. She was a person who was bent over in a straight up world. And all too often, all too many times, she gets overlooked. Because in a straight up world, if you're bent over, you're quite often passed over. And so with that in mind, you can just imagine how surprised she was that day when Jesus noticed her and called her forward. He didn't care about the Sabbath rules. He didn't worry about who he might offend because all he saw was here was a woman in need. And he called her forward and said, woman, you are set free from your ailment. And then he laid his hands on her. And immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. Did you notice that response? She started praising God. She started bearing fruit for God's glory immediately. No hesitation. It reminds me of an old hymn about a person who was broken but then God touched them you know this one 
shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. Have you been touched by God's grace? That was this woman. Been over, worn down, overlooked. And then she was seen and touched and healed. And I want to tell you that, that healing comes in a lot of different forms. But it always comes from God. It's a fascinating thing to consider what it really means to be healed. I once heard a story, a sermon shared by Tony Campolo about his own personal struggles with ministries of healing. He said that he had tried it, but it didn't work for him, at least not the way he expected it to. And one Sunday he was preaching in a church and after the service a man, he came up to Tony This was a man who had been suffering from cancer for years, and Tony prayed for healing with this man. Well, the middle of the following week, Tony Campolo received a phone call from the man's wife. She said, Tony, last Sunday you prayed for my husband. He had cancer. And Campolo thought, whoa, it happened. And she said, he died. Tony Campolo said, I feel terrible. But she said, don't feel bad. When he came into the church that Sunday, he was full of anger. He knew he was going to be dead in a short time, and he hated God. He was 58 years old, and he just wanted to see his children grow up and his grandchildren grow up, and he was angry that this all-powerful God did not take away his sickness and save him. Day after day, week after week, month after week, month after month, he would lie in bed and curse God. And the more his anger grew toward God, the more miserable he was to everyone around him. It was an awful thing to be in his presence. And then he came to church last Sunday, and you prayed for him. And when he left church, a peace came over him and a joy came into him that I had never seen. And Tony, the last three days have been the best days of our lives. We've sung and we've laughed and we've read scriptures and we've prayed. and Oh, they've been wonderful days, Tony. And I call to thank you for laying your hands on him and praying for healing. And then she said something incredibly profound. Listen, Tony, he wasn't cured, but he was healed. You know, cures don't really last that long. I mean, if you get cured, I'm sure there are people here this morning who can testify to God intervening in a time of sickness, but if you're cured, it's only temporary. We're all going to pass on one day. Cures are for time. But the healing of a heart and a soul under the power of the Holy Spirit, that's not for time. That's for all eternity. And I'll tell you this, if I have a choice between being cured for a time and being healed for all eternity, I'll take being healed any day of the week. And I believe in healing. I I know there are people who have great healing ministries. And when Jesus healed people, it wasn't even he that healed. He even said that the work that I do, I do not do of myself. I do it in the name of the Father who sent me. And the same Father who healed people 2,000 years ago, the same God who healed that venerable woman in the synagogue, that same God is alive and well today in our midst. He's here for you and me, those of you watching. You know, 
if we're all completely honest with ourselves, we would have to admit that, that when we look at ourselves in the mirror each morning, when we, what we see oftentimes is maybe a little of that bent over woman in the synagogue and, and life for many of us might have become about as stale as a weak old donut. We're just not engaged with God's kingdom. We're not flourishing. We're, we're striving. God meant far more for us than to just strive, than to just get along. God wants us to thrive and flourish. Maybe we don't believe we have much to offer God's kingdom. You might think, how could God possibly use my life to, to save and nourish broken souls? How, how could God use my life to, to encourage and mentor young people in their walk with Christ? How can God use my prayers to make a difference? What do I have to offer this church as a servant? And so you choose to live a life of withdrawal, unengaged with God's plan for your life to bear fruit for his kingdom. In reality, you're living a bent over life that's not giving much praise to God. Maybe we should ask ourselves, what is keeping us bound up? Spiritually speaking, many if not all of us are bent out of shape for a number of things in our lives. It's like there are invisible cords that just keep us bent over. And when we feel that the weight of the world is on our shoulders, we may, we may be bent over with worry and anxiety. I can do that. Abuse can leave us bent over. Physical abuse, emotional abuse, carrying around dark secrets. Shame can leave us bent over. Heartache and pain, frustration, and poverty. Being unemployed for a significant amount of time, wondering if you have anything to offer the world, facing financial worries, being the object of gossip, dealing with grief and loss, being trapped in sin, all of these things can leave us bent over. I'll readily share with you that my own self-esteem issues Years ago, as a young boy, hung with me throughout my teen years, and that led to many poor choices, things I was ashamed of. And I was living a bent over life. You know, my parents' divorce hit me pretty hard, so I, I carried around the stigma of, I can't. I'm not worth anything. Lord called me at 12, but I fought him for seven, eight years. I can't do that. But then at the age of 19, Jesus touched my heart in a remarkable way. And he told me that his plans for my life, plans that I had been rejecting for years, were still on course. And it was his intent to use me. I just needed to surrender. And I wouldn't be standing here today if I hadn't. And this morning I'm convinced that, that God is calling out to everyone within the sound of my voice. Those of you listening on KIVY and watching on Facebook, those of you in this, this congregation, God is calling out to everyone, saying, I want to bear fruit through your life an abundance of fruit, if you'll just let me, if you'll just allow yourself to believe that I can work through your life. In our story from Scripture, we see that Jesus called to this lady to come to him, and she made her way up to him. And could it be that he's calling you today? 
What's stopping you from coming? Have you resigned yourself to think, well, this is just the way it's going to be from now on? Are you like that fish who is only going to swim in half the aquarium? Have you settled for that? Maybe you've been dealing with a condition that's been lingering for years and your, your hope and your expectancy have just gone away completely and you don't believe God can do anything about it. I want to assure you that God is here for all of you today and all you have to do is say yes to him and the healing will begin. And life will never be the same again. Just surrender to him. Just say, yes, whatever you have in mind, I'll do it. I'll love you with my whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. That lady responded to Jesus. And she was healed. And the same can be true for you today. One of the things that sometimes holds God's people back from bringing about miracles are the self-imposed limitations we, we put on ourselves. We underestimate the extraordinary ways that God can use ordinary people like us. Could something like that be holding you back? If you believe or want to believe that, that God can use you, but that you need God to intervene. You need God to do something in your life that will help you through this, this burden you're dealing with. I want you to pray with me right now. It may not be you, or it might be, but I want you to pray with me right now for yourself or for others who are dealing with this because we're living in a, a world that is very taxing and very trying and very broken. And at the same time, we're blessed with a God that wants to lift us up into his light so we can bear fruit. We just need to reach out to him. Will you join me in prayer? Dear Father, your word promises us we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Father, we believe, 2 Corinthians 12, that your grace is fully sufficient for our lives. We believe your power is perfected in the very midst of our weakness. This is what your word promises. So we plead with you, Father, to bring healing into our lives wherever it is needed. In those places we're aware of, in those places we don't even know about, we need your touch. Allow your spirit to fill us with all the gifts you planned for our lives. And, Father, raise us up into your light that we may flourish as a branch on a vine, the vine of Christ and to bear an abundance of fruit for your kingdom. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Folks, I want to challenge you to ask God for healing and strength every day to make you an instrument of his love and to reveal to you how we can bring you to a point where your life is bearing fruit every day for him. It happened for me 40 years ago. It happened for Abraham, by the way, when he was 75. God isn't limited by age. <laughs> and you might just be surprised by the way he'll work through your life. And if you'd like to experience God's amazing grace this morning and, and be received into his family and maybe become connected to his vine. If you feel the slightest nudge from God's Holy Spirit in your heart right now, urging you to test the waters of his grace, I cannot imagine a more loving church family to experience that in.
than right here. And so I want to invite you to come forward if the Holy Spirit is nudging you to become a part of this church family. As we stand, our, stand and sing our closing hymn, found in your bulletin, we have a story to tell to the nations, number 569. Let's stand and let's sing. Let us pray. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.